This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Thanks, everybody, for downloading the latest edition of Doc and Jock. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me today to break down all things in the world of college football and the NFL, my guy, Adam, the Jock Strozinski. On today's show, we got to break down a classic win by the Michigan Wolverines. Real eye-opener when you dominate Penn State. We got to look at the plight of Michigan State as they head to Ann Arbor in two weeks to take on the Michigan Wolverines. And we'll peek at the Red Wings, who've started the year, unfortunately, an injury. We have to kind of look at how an injury to a key player will affect Derek Lalonde's team, but a great start. If the Red Wings make the roster and they make our breakdown and rundown, that means some good things are happening. And Adam and I, I know for sure, have been peeking into the start of the Red Wings. Because how excited are you when you get an opportunity now to take the stage Come on and gloat about the Michigan Wolverines and how they destroyed Penn State, who whenever, just, it's really weird, man, whenever Penn State comes on the main stage and it's time to play a top 10 opponent, they just crap the bed. And James Franklin is really kind of giving me that uh, Jim Caldwell vibe where he's a decent coach, can recruit, but when it's time to, you know, perform and raise your game, when the bright lights are on, it just does not happen. And it's crazy. Michigan dominated on the ground against Penn State, and it was not even as close as the score dictated. Yeah, you're right. And look, James Franklin, every time he comes to the big house, it seems like he just kind of craps the bed, rolls around in it, and then smears it all over the walls. It's like he can't (laughs) figure it out. It's like his house of horrors. But Michigan absolutely dominated every aspect of that game. All but, I would say, two plays, Michigan had complete control of that game. Going in at halftime, we were on Twitter going back and forth. And I told you, I expected Michigan to lose this game because they hadn't played anybody. But you go through their record, they hadn't played anybody all season. Nobody of worth anyways, nobody of note. Penn State coming into this game was an actual formidable opponent. They played people. They did things. Penn State ranked 10 uh, in, the, in, in the polls, and Penn State has a really good defensive run game. Penn State can shut down the run. What Michigan do? They ran all over Penn State. They played bully ball. Penn State couldn't stop them. So I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell all Michigan fans, it's okay. You can believe now. You can believe. You actually went out, you played an actual opponent, and you got a big win. You got an you absolutely got a big win on Saturday. It's okay to now invest in this team fully. It's okay to now expect this team to be contending for a Big Ten championship, to be contending for a national championship. It's okay to expect those things and demand those things now. Going into this game, totally apprehensive. Look, I still have a ton of questions about JJ McCarthy, and I still don't trust him. You've seen it in you've seen it in this game. Every now and then, he'll have a, like a brain fart or he'll try to make a play that's not there, and it, it'll cost you. It, against better opponents like Ohio State, a play like he had on Saturday for the, that, that, that resulted in a pick six, that's going to bite you in the ass. You might not be able to overcome that. Granted, Michigan dominated and beat the living hell out of Penn State, and because of that, I think it's okay if you're a Michigan fan. You can believe that this team's going to do big things this year. This team might be better than last year's team. Let that sink in. Last year's team was really, really freaking good. Really good. Good enough to get to the college football playoff. Yeah, they got smoked by Georgia. Uh, I think Georgia, obviously, best team in college football last year. Georgia looks like they're asleep at the wheel right now. I don't know if they're bored or if they're just having a little bit of trouble reloading because you have to remember they lost so many guys to, to the NFL last season. Absolutely unreal. Alabama takes a massive loss to Tennessee. I don't really believe in Tennessee, at least not yet. I still think Alabama has an outside shot to get into the college football playoff. I don't believe in Clemson. That really leaves one, one, one opponent. That's Ohio State. Ohio State is, is the big roadblock in your way to not only winning the Big Ten championship, 
but also playing for a college football playoff spot and, and being involved in the college football playoff and possibly winning a national championship. We're going to talk a little bit about Michigan State, and I'm not trying to look past Michigan State. They're, they're coming up in, in about two weeks here, not looking past them at all. But I think if you're a Michigan fan, you have to feel really good about this team. You have to feel really good about what you're seeing. The offense is is basically ground and pound you, just grind you into the ground and hope something opens up downfield for, for J.J. McCarthy to hit a pass or hit a play. Michigan's got really good wide receivers. They have really good tight ends. They have two incredible running backs. That offensive line is so stout. On top of that, defensively, this team's playing out of its mind. Defensively, this team absolutely shut Penn State down this past Saturday. And I think they're going to do it and they're going to continue it all the way up until November 26th. And at that point, I think we're going to have to reevaluate where this team's at, where Ohio State's at. But I, I really do believe at this moment in time, it's going to come down to that Saturday afternoon. And it's going to be for all the marbles. Michigan has been playing absolutely great football. You as a Michigan State fan, you as a guy who loves to bag on Michigan and, and loves to, to, to rub it in and, and talk all kinds of shit about Michigan, what's your take on the Michigan Wolverines right now? Yeah, I'm impressed because Jim Harbaugh has been very, very stubborn in the fact that he, I think he took a look at the program and he said, okay, I want to go in a manner in which I, I know, which is pound the football. I mean, I was shocked that the offensive line played that well, and you saw back-to-back -back runs over 50 yards. I mean, when you see that in college football where Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards can dominate a football game. So I am uh, I, I was definitely, as a football fan, going, man, this is old school. But then, naturally speaking, you, you turn your attention and you say, okay, Tennessee-Alabama played a, 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 you know, a game in the 40s, 50s. Can Michigan you know, muck up a game to that degree to the point where they can compete with the likes of Tennessee and Georgia and Alabama. No, Al Alabama has a loss. So everything now is building towards, obviously, the contest against Ohio State. But I think Michigan State will will figure out a way, at least obviously, they're going to have to find a way to load up and force J.J. McCarthy to throw the football. So I'm thinking... I can't wait for two weeks. Both teams will have a bye week to rest up. But uh, Ohio State still has to go on the road to Penn State. So th the universe could be opening up for scenarios where Michigan can have a great year. And I'm, I'm just flabbergasted that Michigan has decided that we're going to pound the rock, we're going to not throw the football too much, and we're going to just do something repeatedly that works. So I'm very, very much impressed. It's, like it's crazy. It's totally counter to, to anything that you're seeing in college football today. It, it's like stepping back into a, a, a time warp and going back to the 80s and, and, and 90s and watching football that way. Because everything now is basically RPO, right? Everything's like run-pass option. It's a lot of big plays downfield. It, it's taking tops off a of defense and, and trying to, to, to light teams up. This team just wants to get in your face, push you off the ball, and just run it down your throat. And they're cool with picking up five yards at a time. They're cool with picking up 10 yards at a time. Then they'll gash you for 25 or 50, and they're cool with it. it, it it's absolutely crazy watching how they're playing football right now, and they're doing it so well. And I think that's the one thing, if you're a Michigan fan, it should give you a little bit of hope. Like I said, I have a ton of questions about J.J. McCarthy. How do you feel about J.J. McCarthy right now? Because I'm not totally bought in that, that he's the right quarterback for this team. He is the quarterback for this team, at least for the rest of this year, unless something awful happens. That being said, I'm not really invested in him, and I've not really bought into him. Where do you stand on him? He hasn't – see, and if you don't have to, then it's okay because, you know, maybe Michigan State will provide that close game where J.J.'s got to make a play, but you just haven't had to count on J.J. McCarthy to do anything significant. And he's learning on the job. I mean, obviously the bad break was the interception and Penn State was in it in, in the first half. You have to be impressed with Michigan because they made an adjustment and they were able to understand that, hey, Penn State's doing these kind of things, so we're going to continue to lock down defensively and we're not going to let J.J. really launch it too deep. But I've just been impressed. I think my thought on J.J. McCarthy is, is that 
you may be saving the big plays for later down in the road. I feel like they're, they are working on big plays, right? I think that they, they know. They have I mean, to I know. hope so. Yeah, they have to know that they're going to have to score against Ohio State. They're going to have to put up some big numbers to be able to compete on the road. Now, if the game was in Ann Arbor, the big game against Ohio State, I would almost guarantee that they'd win because of how loud it was and what happens. But how nervous are you about everything falling on the game against Ohio State in, in, in several weeks? I mean, if you're a Michigan fan, you should be a little bit nervous. I mean, you, you really should. Here's the thing. I don't think C.J. Stroud has looked great this year. I feel like he looks a little beat up. I don't I, – I look, I, I, I think they've got a really good run game. I think they've got decent wide receivers. I think their offensive line can be taken advantage of. And I'm still not sold on Ohio State's defense. So I feel I feel uneasily confident in this game, if that makes any sense. I, I look, I, I think it'll be one of those games when when we get there, when we're there at, at twelve o'clock on Saturday, November twenty sixth, it'll be one of those things where I think it's gonna be a coin flip game. The problem is Michigan's gotta go on the road to Ohio State. And that's an absolute snake pit. And I don't necessarily trust Michigan going on the road. I just I look. They went into Kennett and and they won a big game against Iowa, and that's awesome. They went to Indiana and they won a game there. That was a bit of a slugfest, especially for that first half. They ended up turning on in the second half, and they showed you that they can do it and they can withstand that, which is awesome. These are all things that help you get better for that time when you've got to go to Ohio State. But honestly, their big test leading up to that game. Look, they've got to get by Michigan State coming up in in what roughly ten days or so, and then after that. You're going to go to Rutgers, so you're going on the road to to a, a team that I, I don't know. Like I don't know what the hell Greg Schiano is doing. Then you're going to take on Nebraska, who's been a bit of a mess this year. You've got a game against Illinois, and I think that's a game that that could possibly be a trap game. Brett Bielema is building something in Illinois. They don't have a quarterback, but it, it's like every team in Wisconsin that you've ever played. They're they're big up front, and they like to run the ball. They they essentially like to play the same style of football you play. They just, I don't think, have as good of athletes as you have. So it does all build to that Ohio State game. I'm confident that they'll get there and it'll all be on the line. And I think when you get there, it's a coin flip game. I, like, I'm not willing to bet my, my life savings that they win that game. But I think that that is what the conversation should be. It should be Michigan, Ohio State, and it should be a, a chance to go on and play in the college football playoff. Yeah, it's going to be fun, man. It's going to be a good time. And I think Michigan really in this year is taking full advantage of a down college football year. You look at it and you say, okay, yeah, the SEC is going to ravage each other. You realize the Pac-10 has USC, UCLA. They're probably going to end up you know, beating up on each other. Alabama losing is a great thing. You have to hope that Penn State can potentially rise up and, and play a great game against Ohio State. It's going to be tough, but I can't wait. I hope both teams, Ohio State and Michigan, go into that game undefeated so we can see there's a chance do you think that and and, and some people have talked about it you know online and things like that you know last year where you saw Alabama and Georgia play each other twice in the conference in the in the conference championship and then um you know in the playoff do you think that potentially if Ohio State just handles their business, they go in undefeated. If it's a real close one point loss and Michigan loses, you think that potentially that is it one and done for Michigan if they lose? Or do you see a scenario in which if Michigan loses, but it's a close game, it's back and forth, that Michigan could still get into the top four and play Ohio State maybe twice this year in a scenario in which the, the Big Ten gets two? You haven't seen that yet where, you know, it's basically the, the college football playoff is dominated by the SEC, and they always seem to get two teams in. Last year, you saw it. You've seen it repeatedly that the college football playoff is basically the home of the SEC. But this year, depending on how it goes, any chance you see two teams from the Big Ten get into the playoff? I think it's possible, but this is the thing. I don't necessarily trust the committee to do that. I think there there's an SEC bias, yeah. and – it would really depend on what takes place in the SEC championship game. Look, I still think that Alabama is going to be playing for for the SEC in, in the SEC championship game, and I think they'll probably play against Georgia. So, depending on how that unfolds, if Georgia gets their undefeated and Alabama has one loss, 
I could see a similar situation that we had last year where Alabama ends up beating Georgia, and next thing you know, both those teams are in, and whoever wins the Big Ten gets in, and then maybe Clemson, if if, if they're still there, you know, I don't it, – it, 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 that's kind of how I would, I would see it working out. And again, I just believe that there tends to be an SEC bias. I don't think this is as good of a Alabama team as we've seen in the past. I don't think this is as good of a team as there was last year. So all that being said, I don't know if they win the SEC championship game. And, and for me, that's the only way that they get in because they've already got that. They've already got that smear on their on their record losing to Tennessee. So I don't know. I, I think there's an opportunity. I think there's a chance for it. But it's going to kind of have to play out like last year is kind of how I would see it working for for Alabama and for Georgia to get in there. Michigan, Ohio State. They play, one loses, and the other one gets in. Honestly, the way I could see this working out, Michigan ends up Michigan would have to beat Ohio State, play in the Big Ten championship game. Ohio State would have to fall to number four. And basically Michigan and Ohio State would basically switch places. And Ohio State would get in that way. That's how I would see it. I don't see Michigan losing to Ohio State and not getting in. Yeah, it's gonna be tough. So it's winner take all. Maybe. The team down south, 60 miles down the road, can do, put a fork in it and cause all kinds of problems by going to Ann Arbor and winning. I don't see it happening, but boy, wouldn't it be great if Mel Tucker can, you know, use this no. crazy, <laughs> use this crazy win that he got against Wisconsin and derail? I don't think so either because Michigan State's defense is terrible, yeah. and I think Michigan can throw five different weapons at you, and maybe now uh, JJ McCarthy will look to avenge the big mistake that he made in East Lansing, but uh, it's good times for Michigan, man. It's good. Everyone's happy. I think that uh, people have now started to kind of put the poor schedule in the rearview mirror because they say, wow, not only can Michigan have, you know, uh, an elite run game, they can do things in a couple different ways as well in regards to throwing Donovan Edwards, Blake Corum, and a lot of different avenues of running the football. So I'm curious to see how, you know, Michigan handles if they get punched in the mouth a little bit. If someone says, okay, we're going to put eight in the box and let's see how you, you handle that. What happens when JJ's tested? That'll be the next test. Well, that'll be the next test. And we, we got to see what happens. That, that was what I think was, was so impressive with this Penn State game yeah. was Penn State did put eight in the box and they were still able to run on them. Yeah. yeah. And the, the problem is JJ just doesn't, there just doesn't seem to be that explosive deep pass yet J- yep. at least not yet maybe they're working on it like you said i'm not 100 percent sure but you did touch on michigan state and look michigan state had a big win this week yep i i, I know the record is what the record is and this season seems like it's a little bit in shambles but i think this was a gut check win i think this was a, a gut check game against look i think wisconsin is, is a rival for both michigan and michigan state i think wisconsin is usually a team that that can really mess up a season. You you know, you could be undefeated and the next thing you know, you take on Wisconsin and now you've got a black mark on your record. Wisconsin can really screw a lot of things up. This was Michigan State's homecoming. To me, it appeared as though Michigan State showed up and and and, and is still invested in this season. What did you take away from this win? What did you learn about this team from this win? Yeah, well, first of all, Mel Tucker Kind of another late game scenario, and you look at it and you say, "Wait a minute! How did you have your team looking like that?" It, it, there was no chance they were going to kick the field goal successfully. The way in which they—I don't know what that was—hurriedly get to the line, and then obviously the interception happens, and you realize what the hell were they trying to accomplish? So that was kind of a little bit eye-opening, in that you would start to think that Mel Tucker would be a little bit more crisp, Nick Saban-esque in terms of details, but that hasn't happened exactly for Michigan State. But I'm glad that the the two best players on the team in Peyton Thorne and Jaden Reed were able to handle business. And you realize, okay, uh, Peyton Thorne checked out of a play and realized, oh, Thorne, um, he realized Reed's uh, single covered. And, oh, that that's an advantage for us. So when he sees that, then there's an opportunity to take advantage. And luckily, Michigan State got the got the victory. They needed it. They, and and to go to two overtimes, it stunk because again, and, and I think it's it's a team that for whatever reason hasn't made the easy play. I mean, in the first overtime, you had a defender, I believe, drop an interception, like right in his hands. It's like the game could be over. And what happens on the next play? Boom, Wisconsin finds their receiver in the end zone. 
I've never seen a team that just for whatever reason, when the opportunity presents itself to shine, they just can't handle it. It's it's really weird. And at this point, you look at it and you say you had to fight to beat Wisconsin, who's on their interim coach right now. So while I was a little disappointed that it was that close of a game, take the win. It's all good. But I look at that defense and I'm not seeing any signs that the defense can hold anybody in a, in a key, in a key moment. I mean, how do you drop a football right in your hands? And, and, and I know they forced some turnovers. They did handle business against Wisconsin. They they did get the W on homecoming. It stopped the four game losing streak. You got to see some dancing in the locker room. You got to see some excitement. But when you look at the nitty gritty as to how they compare against Michigan, man, it's going to be tight for Michigan State to keep it within two or three touchdowns in a game that's going to be critical. But, you know, I think the bye week helps. I'm not so certain. I think that maybe is an interesting debate is would Michigan State like to have just gone and played this weekend as opposed to the bye week? But, you know, looking at Mel Tucker's team, it's just really disappointing that a football team in the Big Ten can go through four games and have a losing streak and then having to kind of scratch and claw to get the win. So it's just disappointing, but I was still into it, still liking to see how Michigan State's doing. But now the big test, uh, it's kind of like, you know, doom and gloom's coming, I'll be there. But at least I kind of feel like, hey, a moral victory would be to keep it like a seven-point game. And that's how I'm looking at it, is just don't get your ass destroyed by 35 points on the road. Yeah, and like here's the thing. I, I think this win was important for Michigan State. For a couple of different reasons. One, I think you got to see a little bit of explosiveness from that offense. Like what they did in that second overtime, I don't know. I was impressed by that. This is a team that that has basically been getting their shit pushed in all year. So for them to even just show up and, and have a little bit of a pulse, I think is 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 a good check mark, right? Building on that, I think the fact that Mel Tucker hasn't lost this team yet. When when you have a season like you had last year. Last year was incredibly special for Michigan State. Incredibly special. To have a season like last year and to look forward to hopefully building on that and things do not go in any sort of way that you had planned. And the season has basically been a backward slide. It's really hard for your players to to just check out or it's really easy for your players just to check out. It's really hard for your coaching staff to keep those players engaged and invested in what's going on in the season. And I think what you ended up getting with 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 this Michigan State team this prior week, I think you got a team that that is showing that they're still invested. They're still listening to this coaching staff. They're still showing up and they're working hard. So take it for what it's worth. I, I think this week was a was a win for the team. I find it interesting though, looking forward to to what's going to happen not this weekend but next weekend. Both Michigan and Michigan State both have bye weeks. Both have additional time to get healthy. Both have additional time to prepare. I'm expecting an absolute beatdown and just a bludgeoning between these two teams. Now, Michigan State season obviously hasn't gone according to plan. Michigan season is is going better than I think anybody expected. Does this game deserve to be the primetime ABC game? Does this game deserve to be the 730 game? Because I think you could make the argument that last year's game, last year's game was absolutely great. It had everything you could ever want and more. Last year's game deserved to be a 730 primetime game not a 12 o'clock start. Instead, this game with a struggling Michigan State who still seems to be checked in on the season is going up against an undefeated Michigan team who looks to have bigger aspirations on the horizon. Does this game deserve to be played at night under the under the bright lights? I don't I, I don't know. Like I, I could see a, a three thirty start would be interesting, and I would love a three thirty start. But I'll be honest with you, I prefer a noon start. It lets me get my drinking in, and then yeah. I can go to my Halloween parties, and I yeah. can be good. Yeah, absolutely. It sucks having that game at seven thirty. I'm an old timer. You know, I got to get out to Ann Arbor by what three o'clock, and then sit there and kind of wait and see what's going on, and then grip, and then you know, hang on every possession and then seven, and then seven thirty, And then, you know, for me, probably staying the entire game is out of the question because I'm not trying to stay there till midnight and then one o'clock. I gotta, I gotta be realistic here because I think the next day I gotta cover the lions, you know? So yeah. it sucks to have a seven thirty game. It's the worst option of the three. Now it's fun, but I just hope that the student body obviously is safe and that not too many people are drunk and unruly um, by the time the game gets there. So you always look at safety measures in regards to these decisions, but it's ratings. I think people will 
tune in at a high clip. So it's all about television. It's all about the ratings. So that's what they decide. But I think 3.30 is that prime spot. I think it's perfect. You, you let everybody kind of enjoy a little bit of tailgating, get to the game, and you handle business. Noon's a little early, you know, because everybody gets settled and you don't get that much tailgating time in if you get it to a noon game. I mean, most people will tailgate at 9 and things like that. 3.30 is perfect. Gives you enough time to do your thing. Then you can sober up. Then enjoy a game. Uh, drink a little more and then and then call it a day. But, yeah, I'm not a fan of the 7.30, you know, time personally. I mean, but it, but the, the TV it, dictates it. It, it, well, for sure. It's all about TV rights. But it, especially if you have to try to get out of there. I mean, that's one of those things where you got to get home from Ann Arbor so you can wake up the next morning and, and oh. go cover the Lions and, and, and watch the Lions get their shit pushed in. Yeah. I mean, you'll be lucky if you get home by what? Midnight. Two o'clock in the morning, maybe? Yeah, that if you stay if you stay for pressers, yeah, and I got to be, uh, by, be at Ford Field by nine for the Dolphins game. Yeah. You know? Oh, oh, it's gonna be so. Yeah, it's gotta. Be, I gotta be responsible. You know, to to handle it the right way because you still got content for the next day. But we'll see what happens now. Now, on the flip side, if Michigan State comes out to like a fourteen nothing lead, I'll be like juiced up for for hours. Might not even sleep. You know, I might just uh, tag and tweet every single Michigan person that I know because I think it might be the greatest upset in the history of the Big Ten if this if this Mel Tucker team can go to Ann Arbor and defeat. Jim Harbaugh? Oh, that'd be awesome. That'd be that'd be amazing. So that would be that would be something that would definitely uh spike the adrenaline and, and keep it moving. But no, 730 is not the best time. And and plus, the way in which college football goes, man, these games go four hours with all the commercials, yeah. the 20 minute halftime, you know, so uh, uh, not the best decisions, but I think that it'll be a great time for for both fan bases. Michigan probably will get on the board now, Jim Harbaugh. Probably will go to one and two against Mel Tucker, and uh, we can see what's gonna. We, we we can see how Michigan State competes. That's that's the kind of uh, the the only way we can put it is it's a moral victory time for Michigan State to see just how many points they're going to lose by. But it's gonna be now two weeks. Next week, stay tuned to Doc and Jock as we preview it. Start messaging start messaging us now at Detroit Podcast. Who do you, what do you think? Who do you think has the early edge? You know, Michigan State social media kind of doing some. Uh, Crazy things, putting the Michigan block M upside down, which caught the attention of everybody. I was like, oh, okay. You know, I'm, maybe not the year to kind of be doing that. I mean, I, I like it, but <laughs> not the year to be giving Michigan anything of bulletin board <laughs> material. So let's turn our attention now to a hockey team that is performing at a great high level to start the year. Because the wing starting 2-0 and was fabulous, was spectacular. Derek Lalone could not have asked for a better start. Scoring goals, good goaltending, solid defense. Man, it was all good, but some bad news. Tyler Bertuzzi out for four to six weeks, and the numbers bear out that the the Red Wings don't play as good with Bertuzzi out. Man, I'm curious. What would you make of the Wings' first three games of the season? I think it's you're seeing you're seeing a it's almost totally different, right? You're seeing a team that that doesn't look like last year's team. I think you're seeing a team that is uh, that, that can put the puck in the net, that offensively can generate goals, and they don't give up. There was the, the game against New Jersey. They went down. They fought their way back. They ended up winning that game 4-2. Uh, in, uh, in, in the overtime game against the, the Kings, wings were down, what, 4-3 to three with a minute 30 left. Puck gets turned over. Uh, was it? I think it was Edmondson. Might have the wrong guy's name. But anyways, uh, Los Angeles Kings going in on an open net. Next thing you know, you've got your captain. This is important. You've got your captain showing that you don't give up on plays, that you don't stop playing defense, that you don't stop back checking, back checks, and basically forces a turnover. Play comes back the other way. Next thing you know, the wings tie it up. They go to overtime. They get a point out of the deal. So, I, I, look, I think what you're seeing is a team that is playing defensively, very responsibly, and you've got a team that that is buying in uh, and, and playing good offense. Now, it sucks that you lose Tyler Bertuzzi. Obviously, he's – I don't think anybody on this team does what he does or does the things that he can do. I don't think anybody on this team is a, is a, is a good enough mix of, of grit, his hands, his skills, his speed – uh, and has a nose for going into the boards and making other guys kind of pay for it a little bit and comes away with the puck. So it's going to be hard to replace him, but I think you've got guys on this team who can replace some of that production. I think what you're getting on the defensive line, I think defensively this team looks much better than it did last year. 
And offensively, you add in a couple of veterans like like David Perron. I think that helps elevate everybody else. That's a guy who's been there, done that. He's a guy who can score goals. So I, I like what this team looks like. I like the way this team is built so far. I like what I've seen very, very early in the season. I think this team looks really, really good right now. What 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 are, what are you making about basically how they've started off? It's yeah. been a white hot start for this team. Yeah, I was disappointed a little bit that they tied the you know Kings and then lost in overtime, but it's okay. You know, <clears throat> you look at the Red Wings and to have that start, I thought was fabulous. I thought opening night was great. You saw a team that was skating fast, really looked like a team that was just completely different than what was under Jeff Blashill. And that was the first sign I wanted to see was just don't look like the defensive sloppy mess that you were against, you know, so many opponents last season under Blashill. So there's an attitude. There's an identity. Play defense. Clear the puck out. Hey, here's the thing. Back check. You, you turn the puck over. You get in front of the net. You clear the puck out. What a, what a novel idea, you know? Score more goals than your opponent. Play good defense. All has been great, and it looks like a coach that's got his shit together. So that's all we can ask for is an opportunity that you start the year against Montreal. And I don't know if you saw the video online. Some dude got an octopus out there, and he hit it like it like almost like a drug dealer. He had it like pinned to his body. He kind of takes it out from under his shirt and then kind of goes down like 15 flights of, of stairs and takes the octopus and throws it. Kind of makes you, you know— Makes you miss the old guy who you kind of wish he didn't piss in the drain, but oh, well, let's hear nor there. You know, <laughs> you wish he would have kept his kept his thing and his, you know. But hey, when you gotta go, you gotta go. And it happened to me. If you want to know a quick story, I uh, <clears throat> at, uh, a couple weeks ago to kind of go back to college football for a little bit, I walked back to my car in the parking lot and I had the pressure. I was like, "Fuck, I'm not gonna be able to drive an hour and a half home. I should have pissed somewhere else." I look and there's it's it's dead silent. The second I unzip my pants. And it's about to flow out in the parking lot on the side of there by a car. Cars come by. I'm like, shit. And it's the worst feeling when you start to go and then you got to pull it back a little bit. So, boom, uh, pull up my pants. And I'm like, this is the worst thing ever. So then the car finally moved by and I let it rip in, in the uh, in the parking lot there. And I'm like, fuck, man, I'm a, I got my badge on here and I'm just like letting it whiz. I didn't care, dude. It was the best feeling ever. And you realize that, hey, man, poor Al Sabatka. I wonder, you know, you know how he's going to, how he's going to adapt now, not being part of the Red Wings. It's going to be different to have the new Zamboni driver, but you got to go, man. I just think that I don't know on this one. I didn't view doing what he did as a big deal, but I guess if you do it in front of people or you get caught, not the best I mean, thing. It's also, it, it, it's also, I don't know, like Illich Holdings is is yeah. like an actual. Company, company, so, like, company. I get it. You and I both get it. Can't I don't do know, I that. walk out in my backyard and I piss out in my backyard all the time. I don't care. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, but you can't do so, it on the, in the work setting. But it's just right. Exactly. It, you know, in a pub, in a sports facility with all that, with all the people around. But you would think that where does the the loyalty of all the years of service go? Hey, like a suspension, like not a dismissal, but well, it's it's interesting to see that there's somebody new there and and things like that. But then you go and you play New Jersey, and they're a struggling team too. You handle business. You come back home, you get the points. You get points in the first three games because it's just crazy that, to think that the, the the Wings need 100 points to get into the playoffs. It's going to be tough, but for the Red Wings, I'm definitely happy with the line combinations. Are you sensing now? Because there's somebody on the other end of the phone here by the name of Jack who was not the biggest supporter of Dylan Larkin. Larkin looks like he's got a little bit of a, of, of a jolt in his system here. You think the contract potentially is something that is easing up on, uh, you know, making Larkin a lot more comfortable and recognizing that, hey, he understands what, I think he's been given the vote of confidence by the organization. And I think his play is reflecting it. I think the, 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 the big boss stepping in and having a conversation with him being like, if you want the C, you got to earn the C. And basically what you've done so far hasn't been jack squat. So get on your horse and start working. I think that that has gone a long way, and that is kind of what you're seeing. I think there's also a bit of a different buy-in with Derek Lalone. I, I don't know if Dylan Larkin totally bought in to, to what the previous regime was doing or what they were trying to sell. Remember, Dylan Larkin didn't play in Grand Rapids. Dylan Larkin didn't come up underneath that regime, didn't really – 
was wasn't there to win a Calder Trophy. Didn't really have all of that. He basically came from from the University of Michigan, and they granted him a starting spot, which was really weird. And he's kind of grew that way. So I don't think he ever really meshed with Jeff Lashell. I don't think he ever really meshed with Jeff Lashell's regime. And I just don't think he necessarily bought in. I think there's a little bit more of a buy-in now. And I think Steve Eisman may be stepping in and being a little bit more vocal, kind of poking him in the chest saying, look, you need to be better. You're not doing enough. I think that maybe has gone a little bit of a long way. And that's why you're seeing what you're seeing. So but look, you, but still think, not a huge fan of Larkin. But yeah. I, look, I like him actually coming back and playing defense and doing yes. the back checking. Like, that's impressive. That goes a long way. When you've got guys who are, are who, who loaf on defense or – or just don't necessarily play to their full potential defensively. They're just kind of there. They're a pylon. That, that, that doesn't help you win games. When your captain's out there diving, trying to, to poke check a puck off of a guy's stick who's basically staring down an empty net and, and basically helping you earn a point and possibly have a chance to go on to win, that's a big deal. It says a lot, and I like that. Yeah, he's in the final year of a five-year, $30.5 million deal. Six point one million dollar cap hit. I think the next deal probably he wants probably five and forty five or a lot more. But I, I like the number five and forty eight million a year, reasonable but not too exorbitant. But you, you look at it and you say he's probably playing for a big contract extension. And if that gets him motivated for this year, along with talking to Iserman, hey, it's to the benefit of the Red Wings. And I think it's good for Larkin to play with 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 more talent. I think that. You know, obviously you feel bad for Blashill a little bit in that the second he gets canned, uh, Steve Eiserman kind of overhauls the roster a little bit. But, hey, to each their own, and Lalonde has the opportunity to set forth a path that I think is going to get the Wings a lot of points. I think it's there's a lot of good things. But, you know, obviously uh, the first-line winger is gone. Who the hell now do we turn to and say, okay, Bertuzzi's gone. Who makes up the point differential? Because the dude was scoring. The dude was part of a, 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 of a good line there that was potentially going to do some big things. What the hell now are the Wings going to do in the absence of Tyler Bertuzzi? I mean, look, you got guys like, that you brought in. You got big-name free agents like Andrew Kopp. I think yeah. he's a guy who can put some pucks in the net. Uh, you got um, David Perron, who I mentioned earlier. I think a little bit more falls on guy like guys like Jacob Verana, uh, Elmer Soderblom, who's been quite impressive. Dude's a gargantuan Man, he's a human giant just out there skating around on skates. He's got to be what, like seven foot tall, seven foot one. (laughs) So like, I mean, you, you've got guys, you've got, you've got talented players who can step up and, and can kind of offset some of that production that'll be missing. And those are the guys that, that I would look to, to, to be able to do that. Uh, Look, I think where you're going to really miss Bertuzzi is going to be along the boards. I think it's going to be those plays when the puck gets shot deep into the deep into the zone. Somebody's got to go dig it out. Somebody's got to go fish it out from from the corners. I think that's where you're going to miss Tyler Bertuzzi the most because he's so active and a lot of times he's an agitator in those deep in those zones. And he also has the ability to basically dig the puck out of the zone or out of the corner and skate it to the front of the net and generate a scoring chance or at least open up a passing lane where somebody can get a really nice shot. I think that's where you'll miss him the most. Okay, it's a good start, man. It's nice to see the Joe Louis Arena buzzing. They were buzzing loud, nice and loud there. The crowd excited, desperate for any sort of winning. So to get a couple wins and to get at least a point in an overtime game, I think is lo- is, is a lot is a lot of good signs for where the Wings are and goaltending. Look, so far so good for the goaltending. Um, I think I like Huso uh, a little bit more than Nedeljkovic. So, you know, just based on the play, but I think right now the competition between the, the both of them has a great opportunity to to really uh, elevate both of their play, and, and hopefully Huso emerges to be the number one guy because for some reason, Nildelkovic just has this kind of tendency to kind of be streaky. So I'm curious to see how that's going to play out moving forward. Who's going to take the grasp? Because I think the, the hardest job besides the Detroit Lions quarterback is who's playing goaltender. For the, for the wings, and so far so good for both Huso and Nildelkovic. All right, final 10 minutes here. We have to. I'm sorry to do it. I know it's not all good. I know it's not, you know, I know the bye week was supposed to be something great for the wing. Uh, excuse me. I know the bye week was supposed to be something great for the Lions, but it ended up being 
a situation that we're going to talk about it actually being a bad thing for the Lions because we all got a chance to see other NFL teams have success. So I want to talk to you. After the bye week, the Lions sit at 1-4, and four, and changes are going to be made defensively. Dan Campbell looked at everything, and they got to kind of take a step back. What has to happen? Who has to step up in your mind for this Detroit Lions football team to take a step forward? For me, I would say, um, not knowing yet what your thoughts are regarding how this team takes a step forward, I think that Jared Goff just has to stop turning the football over. If he can play a cleaner game, not spot seven points to the opponent, play and rebound after a bad game against the Patriots, this football team with a, with Amandra St. Brown and hopefully uh, DeAndre Swift being healthy should put up a lot of points against the Cowboys defense. And if the the quarterback can stop fumbling it when he doesn't need to or, or, or throwing pick sixes, I think this football team offensively can take a, can take a step forward at least rebound after the Patriots game. Bro, you want this guy to come in and you want him to play perfect football. This was a guy yes. who we, we were basically checked out on Step when it up. the season started. Earn your money. Trying, we've been trying to replace him for two years now. Listen, I know we have, but dude, dude, if you think about it, what bigger motivation is there than a $40 million contract? Look, if the Lions don't want you, some bum team, there's 31 other stupid-ass coaches out there. If you just play good enough and play clean and y- y- you don't – be the guy that's the cause of momentum swings, there's $30 million minimum waiting for Jared Goff. It might even be from the Lions now if he does it, but I think that something has to fuel this man to play better. And he, and I know it's not a big deal because the offense has done well and defense is, is a shitstorm, but his turnovers have been momentum changing and they are killer in regards to giving the opponent seven points. So I think that if he if he plays clean, I think the defense can play just good enough to go from the worst of all time into like the the mid twenties. Here's the thing: this is where I'm at, and this is twofold for me. One is more long term; one is more uh, immediate and 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 going to help result in wins this season, and one's going to help make this organization better. So immediately, I think you have to look at a guy like Aaron Glenn. I think Aaron Glenn yeah. has to put guys in better spots to do a little bit more or be a little bit more productive, possibly take some stuff off of some of these guys' plates because maybe they're just overwhelmed. I don't know. Generally, in the National Football League, when you're thinking too much, you're playing way too slow and the play's already gone by you and you you can't do anything about it. Next thing you know, seven points are going up on the board. But I think Aaron Glenn's got to find a way to to create production from a guy like Aiden Hutchinson has to find a way to create production from a guy like Malcolm Rodriguez, has to find a way to to now cover up for a unit that is really beat up in that secondary. And a, a way to do that is move guys around. Aiden Hutchinson doesn't always have to play on the edge. Aiden Hutchinson can drop back and, and basically line up as a linebacker and you can rush him in. Aiden Hutchinson can, can play in the middle of the line. Uh, Malcolm Rodriguez, another guy who can play up on the line or a guy who can play just off of the line. And, and you can do different schemes. You can do different fits. There are different things that you can do to get these guys into the backfield, put pressure on the quarterback, uh, have a couple tackles for losses. And I think all of that results in this team getting off the field on third downs. And I think immediately that's what has to get done. And that's what will help make this team better. Only gave up long term. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, only 22 points, though, the defense gave up to Bailey Zappi. The, the offense gave up seven. Bro, so he was a third-string quarterback. Come on. But, but you watched, What are we talking about You here? watched this week, and he looked good, too. Bailey Zappi's no bum. I'm not saying he's a bum, but what I'm saying is he's a rookie third-string quarterback. Like, there, there's no reason you should give up 22 points. Like That, that shouldn't be a thing. Like that, like we shouldn't even be here having this conversation right now. Like, yeah, yeah look, I know the offense got shut out. Uh, a week ago. I, look, I get that, right? I totally understand that. They looked awful against New England. That offense has been the only thing basically dragging this carcass of a team across the finish line every week, whether they win or they lose. It's generally the offense that is picking them up on their back and, and carrying them to, to, to demand more out of Jared Goff, who you and I both agree is a bottom third quarterback in this league. The guy's been playing absolutely out of his mind. He's been playing on par up until up until the previous week when he when they went up against New England. He's been playing on par with the likes of Lamar Jackson, 
um, Allen and Buffalo, uh, Mahomes, Mahomes, um, Mahomes, um, who else? Wow. Jalen Hurts. They've been playing on par with those guys. I mean, like, what, what are we talking about here? Well, you want him to go out and you want him to play exceptional, perfect football, get a perfect quarterback rating. I don't think that's going to happen. I just like that. I think that's way too much to expect out of out of that guy. That guy specifically. You can get more production out of guys who aren't doing shit. Have you been impressed at all by what you've seen out of anybody on this defense? Specifically, no. Aiden Hutchinson. <laughs> specifically, Malcolm Rodriguez. Have those guys really impressed you at all this year? It's, Aiden Hutchinson had one game. One game. I need more than whatever you're doing for one game. you yeah. got to be better, man. They, and the good thing is John Kaminsky, Josh Paschal, they're getting some reinforcements back. Maybe that unlocks Aiden Hutchinson again. Maybe you have the opportunity. Bro, how, how bad, what kind of bad luck do the Lions have in the second round? Levi Onzerike, another back surgery. He's gone See, for the year. This is where I was going with my long term. Yeah, you got to stop long fucking term. around in the draft. Brett. Brad Holmes got to be better, man. Yeah. Brad Holmes has to be better. You can't swing and miss constantly with your second round, second round picks. That Levi Onzerike pick looks like you just flushed it down the toilet for no good reason. I look, I, I'm going to say right now, dude's bust. Dude's an absolute bust. Hasn't given you shit in two years. He's not giving you nothing this year. Maybe he can come back year three. I doubt it. He's a bust. That was a bad pick. Bad pick. You, you can't go and draft guys and be like, oh, yeah, we knew they were hurt. And then just sit there and stash them away for the following year. You can't do that. Your your defense is getting their shit pushed in every single week. Like you like that 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 just doesn't make sense. Look, Brad Holmes, exceptional at evaluating talent on offense. He's an absolute bum when it comes to evaluating talent on defense. Absolute bum. You got to get your shit together. You can't you can't swing and miss on these second round picks. First, second, third. Fourth round, those guys should be giving you quality snaps. Your fifth round picks should be rotational players, maybe even your sixth round picks. Seventh round guys, it's kind of a hope and a prayer. You just like, give me something. Give me a little bit. Maybe we can get you in. Maybe maybe you can make a play. That's how it should be. You're getting nothing out of your second round. Absolutely nothing. And I, I think that's killing this team. Oh, look, a lot of what's going on with this roster – we talked about it. There was no big moves in free agency for this for this defense. You basically brought back all the clowns that you had last year, all the guys who were a bunch of try-hard guys. And look, try-hard guys, they're great. They're great. But those guys are, are, are guys that you rotate in when your superstars, when your studs need breaks, they need to breathe. He didn't do anything this offseason for, for the defense. To help them out in zero ways. Didn't do a damn thing. And then you go and you draft guys who aren't healthy to start the year and you know they're not going to be healthy, or at least you claim you know that they're not going to be healthy. You just look like an idiot. Like you can't do that. You you can't you can't tell me that 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 this team doesn't look better uh if they would have drafted um what, the nose tackle out of Georgia last year. Went to the Jets, right? I think he went to the Jets. Big man. What's his name? Tell me, help me, help me out here. It, uh you mean to the Eagles, Jordan Davis? Jordan Davis, yeah, there you go. Jordan Davis. He went to the Eagles. Sorry, we knew the team was green. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> yes. You, you can't tell me that the team wouldn't be better if they didn't have Jordan Davis. Like, yeah. you, you wouldn't be getting ran on at least. Right. That would clog up the middle and, yep. pro, and help collapse the pocket. Yep, absolutely. It's 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 crazy. And then you draft Jamison Williams when you, you have such a bad defense. You, you maybe, yeah. Luxury is maybe not the time, maybe just one year too soon to go you for luxury. You know what luxury. it reminds me of? You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of your defense basically being in shambles and you going out and you draft Brandon Pettigrew yeah. <laughs> when you could have had Ray Malaluga. Yeah. Or you go out and you draft um, Eric Ebron when, when you could have had Aaron Donald. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You, you, again, you, you, put, you put things that, that you want, the shiny object, the, 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 the sizzle, not the steak. You, you go and you grab those things. And you totally neglect what you really need. What you really need. You know, it's yeah. just it, it's moves Impact. like that that, that piss yeah. me off. Yeah, and it was tough too because, like we said when I started the segment, you sit back and you realize, whoa, because we all what we all did was we took a break from the Lions and we go, what the hell? The Jets are four and two. Robert Sala got go a defense other football, and you're like, wow, it's really good. Yeah, it's really good. The 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 Giants have five wins with a quarterback that you think that potentially is not as good as Jared Goff. You realize, bro. That- let, let me let, let me put it to you like this: If Jared Goff played on the Giants, we'd be talking about the Giants as a playoff contending team that has an outside shot outside shot at winning the Super Bowl. Right, and, and so, don't tell me I'm wrong. And so here, here's the part that people are like not understanding when you hear complaints about the Lions. 
Okay, here's what it is. Nobody's saying that this football team should be 5-0. and Nobody's saying that. What we're saying is the reason fans are pissed is not because we're giving up on Dan Campbell, giving up on Brad Holmes. What we're saying is, and to put it clearly so people understand it, if Brian Dayball was the coach of the Lions, if Robert Sala was the coach of the Lions right now, with the injuries, with the story, with Aiden, with with whatever injury he was dealing with, with what's going on, my belief would be this football team would be at worst three and one. They would have better game plans. They would not put the team in bad positions. They would have the team playing better. And that's the belief. That's the argument. It's not, do we want to fire Dan Campbell? Do we want to move on? The reason why, it's not about patience. It's about knowing that at the very worst, you could potentially have a two two wins out of four, be two and two. The Seattle Seahawks. Why are the Seahawks with Geno Smith three and three? Because they have a decent, experienced coach. That's the source of frustration is that people believe that the source of the Lions' problems is Dan Campbell. That's where the anger lies, and that's where I'm believing. Robert Sala's got this team playing, uh, the, the, the Jets playing at such a good level. They go to Green Bay and whoop the ass of the Green Bay Packers. They go in and they perform at a high level defensively. Sauce Gardner, number four pick, he ain't, he ain't struggling. He ain't looking lost. He, he's out there balling. And what the Lions do? They had Matt Patricia probably put so much information in Jeff Okuda's head that he didn't know his left foot from his right foot. So that's why I think people are mad is that they saw other rebuilds and they see better coaching. I think the Lions are not a well-coached team. And you said it. They got to do well uh, defensively, offensively. They're humming. Let's see how they do. But I think that Dan Campbell and the coaching staff with their their hyper-aggressive nature has not done a good enough job to win football games. You can't be one and four. It's not good enough. At the very least, most people thought they'd be two and three, three and two, and maybe at the high end, maybe get lucky and get four and one. But to be one and four with probably no shot to beat Dallas is gonna be it's gonna be bad if the if the the, the Lions come back one and five. I don't see really too many scenarios that the Lions can go to Dallas and win the game. It's gonna be fun. I think it's gonna be a high scoring game, but I think Dak Prescott is going to come in and and come back. And Micah Parsons, obviously, he's going to have to have a strip sack. And obviously, probably, he'll, he'll be the one high-stepping to the end zone. I see probably a touchdown loss, 38 to uh, probably 38-31 in that range. I don't see a scenario in which the Cowboys win. Am I wrong? Am I being too fatalistic? Or can the Lions get their second win against Dallas? I don't think the Lions do. Nope. Look, I think Dallas has a really good... Uh, a really good pass game. I think they've got really talented wide receivers. I don't think the the Lions secondary at this point in the season, as beat up as it is, I know they're coming off of a bye week. And, and I think uh, after bye weeks, they're like 7-2-1 and one or something like that the last 10 years. They're generally a very good team after the bye. I don't think this team defensively has enough to to stop those wide receivers. You add in Dak Prescott coming back. I think Dak's ready to go. Uh, I think this run game for Dallas will look incredibly healthy against this Lions defensive front. So I just don't think they can slow this offense down. Now, on the flip side, you've got uh, Trayvon Diggs, who's arguably one of the best cornerbacks in the league, and he's going to shut down whomever. (laughs) You know, I think he'll probably line up uh, across from Amonra St. Brown, and he'll just be negated from most of this game. So it's going to be incredibly challenging. And look, we don't know if DeAndre Swift is going to play or not. Uh, There's been some speculation that maybe he will at the time that we're recording this. We don't know yet. So, look, I I don't think a guy like Jamal Williams and I don't think the the, the rest of the cast and crew in the running back room is going to be able to get the job done. Okay. We all realize DeAndre Swift's a little bit of a a different different running back. So I, I just... I don't. Wow. I don't see them being able to get the win here. Ah, man, one in five, cause it's tough. Because it is horrible. Cause yeah. we went through and we looked at the easy part of the yeah. schedule. And we're like, was, all right, cool. Going into this game, you should be maybe three and two, two and which, three at the worst. Which speaks to how quickly the NFL can turn around if things are put well. You're expecting this turnaround for next year and 2024. If you don't get it. Boy, and it's true. The fans are not happy, and it's good. You fans should expect more. It's not the fans' job to be undi- uh, um, to be hopeful forever. It's it's not like that. It does not work like that. In year two, you got to put up some wins, and it doesn't have to be a lot. But remember, the reason 
that people are mad is not because they thought that the Lions were going to have 10 wins. It's because we thought they were going to have 6-7. When you start 1-4, and four, that means you're on pace for 3-4 to four wins, guys. That's why we're mad. To go from uh, 3 wins one year to 4 wins the next year is horrible. Dan Campbell it has the least amount of wins of the coaches remaining that were hired in 2021. That produces anger. So stop telling us to be patient. No, turn it around. Figure out your defense. Hopefully, they at least play an entertaining game. Dallas, Detroit. Hopefully, the calls go the Lions' way in some way, or at least it goes fair in some way, shape, or form, because there's always some weird herky-jerky call that takes place when the Lions go out to Dallas. But can't wait to see it. This Sunday, Lions and Cowboys. Should be a good one. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network on Twitter at Detroit Podcast. So appreciative of everybody that tunes in and gets after us, leaves good comments when we ask good questions like, hey, right now featured on our Twitter page is, hey, weigh in on the debate. Should the Lions have potentially taken Micah Parsons, who looks like a superstar, but you have a good player on your roster in Panay Sewell. Weigh in. Let us know what you think as the Lions approach a big game against the Dallas Cowboys. Thanks, everybody. Make sure you, you like, subscribe, and share. If you have a friend that's asking the question, what podcast should I be listening to? Tell them. The Detroit Sports Podcast Network.